Welcome back to our regular Friday night talk series on breaking memes after a very long three weeks break for Chinese New Year. My name is Bobby Ng and uh, I'm your MC for tonight. Tonight's talk is hosted by the Buddhist Gem Fellowship and it's being cross broadcasted across 16 Buddhist organizations' Facebook pages. The topic for tonight's breaking myth series number 19 is hopes and dreams, also known as how to handle failure. We teach our children how to be successful, but almost no one teaches them how to handle failure. Are we all prepared to handle failure, humiliation, loss and blame? So before we get the speaker on, a first a short introduction to Dr. Punya. Dr. Punya Wong is an associate professor in internal medicine at the Monash University, Malaysia in Johor Bahru. He has been sharing the Dharma regularly in Malaysia, Singapore, Jakarta, Manila, Ho Chi Minh City, and Bangkok in the last decade. Let us invite Dr. Punya Wong for the 19th talk in the Breaking Myth series entitled Hopes and Dreams How to Handle Failure. Over to you, Dr. Punya. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Brother Bobby. Just let me make sure that the screen sharing is successful. Yes. All right. All right. Good. Namo Buddhaya, Dhamma, Dhamma family. I hope everyone had a good Chinese New Year and that you managed to connect with your loved ones either face to face or on the internet. We are now back to our usual Friday night sharing and this is the 19th sharing in this series and tonight we're going to share on a topic which I am personally passionate about and this is about hopes, dreams, and how to handle failure. You know, we all are Dhamma students, and we all study the Buddha Dhamma. And one of the foundation that we learn is with the four noble truths. And these are the common denominators of life. In the first noble truth, Dukkha Satcha, the noble truth of dissatisfaction, of unhappiness or suffering, it teaches us that with birth, decay, aging, disease, death, associating with people that are not pleasant, separation from those that we love, not getting what we want, and basically things that we attach to they give rise to stress, to suffering, to emo, to unhappiness, because all these are compound things subject to impermanence, subject to ever changing phenomena. And because of that, it can never be stable or satisfactory. And ultimately we will find that they give rise to stress and unhappiness. Now, this is in the very foundation of the Buddha Dharma. It literally tells you that as long as you are living as a human being on earth, you are going to face things that are going to create unhappiness. So why is it that when we are fully aware of this fact, as anybody who has lived and worked will know, why are we not teaching our children? Why am I not teaching my medical students? Why am I not teaching those people I'm supposed to teach? Why am, not, why am I not teaching them how to handle failures in life? We only teach our children, we invest so much in our children on how to be successful. Corporate people spend thousands of dollars to attend talks which inspire them to ever more success, make more money. But why is it that we are not teaching, preparing our younger generation, those in the workforce, how to handle failure, how to handle disappointment? 
um, as a doctor, as a medical teacher, I think this is very important because in the course of my work, I see young doctors being scolded. I see people getting very disappointed and many of them simply do not have the living skills on how to handle these things. So yes, we invest a lot in our children on how to be successful, we prepare them to be successful, but we do not teach them how to deal with disappointment and failure. And every now and then you will read in the newspaper of somebody, a child who didn't do well in a public exam and then unable to handle it, commit suicide or something to the equivalent. So I think one of the first lessons that we have to learn is to see the first noble truth and not just talk about it, recite it, but actually accept and learn that as long as we are around, we are going to see disappointment. We're going to see failure. Somebody is going to blame us. Somebody is going to criticize us. And somebody is going to tell that you are useless. And of course, the opposite. Someone will praise you. Someone will say you're very good. Someone will say you're the best thing that ever happened to me. These extremes are part of our life. And we have to teach our people how to handle them. And in fact, how to see failure as an opportunity for reinvention, for a new beginning, and to learn to correct ourselves if we are actually at fault. Now, every one of us dreams of the future. We ceaselessly dream and hope for something better in the future. And of course, in many ways, this gives us hope. This gives us strength in the midst of difficulties. And we hear of our forefathers who had such sad, difficult lives, but yet managed to go on because they hoped, they dreamed, they saw a better future for their children and grandchildren. But just dreaming and hoping and not doing anything about it is just fantasy. We will have to translate whatever we dream of or hope for by actions. Now, one of the most important lessons that I've learned in the Buddha Dharma is the skill to calm my mind. And this is especially so when failure or disappointment strikes or when someone tells you in the face you are stupid or useless or hopeless. We need to have emotional calmness. For many a times, we respond immediately with knee-jerk sort of responses, conditioned from our previous experience, and only live to regret it, because that may not be the best response, not the most logical or rational response. So yes, one of the key lessons in the Buddha Dharma is to train our mind to have samasati, sama, samadhi, which is how to be mindful, how to be still in the midst of emotions which are raging. We learn how to stay cool, calm, and collected, to relax and keep our emotions under control. We had shared many a times in the past, at least in this. 19 sharings that we have done here, that a basic teaching that we learn from the Buddha Dharma is how to control our emotional minds, not to let emotions dominate our decision, but to calm ourselves down, to still the mind, and to let our rational or thinking mind work out the best response to any situation. Controlling the emotional aspect of the brain, the limbic system, to allow the logical aspect, the neocortex, the front part of the brain, the new brain, to come out to a wise, rational decision. So goals are skillful means. And yes, while they are an important tool for us, for all of you who are dreaming of some 
future goal, please realize also that these goals are merely a skillful mean to give you a direction. And that we must also not be overly attached to these goals as circumstances change. And all of life is a flow. Now, one of the most ridiculous questions I can ever think of is when a primary school child is asked, what do you hope to be when you grow old? Now, realistically speaking, a primary school child has absolutely no idea what the world of adults is. Neither does he or she have any realistic idea of what those various occupations that he or she may see on TV actually do. Even my own medical students who come to med school, many of them have actually no idea what the life of a medical doctor truly is. You know, at one time, Quincy MD was a popular show on TV. And I remember a young teenage chap talking to me and I asked him, what do you want to be when you become older? What are your hopes, your dreams? And without hesitation, he replied, I want to be a forensic pathologist. Good heavens, I think the only exposure to forensic pathology that he had is in that te television series called Quincy. The world of forensic pathology is far, far away from what he imagines. So what I'm trying to share is that you can only have hopes and dreams of what you are aware of and understand at this point in time. And as you grow older, as you mature, as your worldview changes, you will realize that there is far more. So yes, you can have hopes, you can have dreams, but do not tie yourself such that, oh dear, if I do not attain them, I have failed because these are merely a skillful means to give us a direction. What you do not know, you will not have hopes or dreams, sorry. So let us not tie our self-worth and happiness to a must-do accomplishment of these goals. For both we ourselves, our outlook, and our environment will inevitably change. Yes, of course, you will plan, you will hope, you will dream, but always be ready to wake up and change at any time and even to walk away and restart. We must not give the goals of career accomplishment or status a guardian knot to tie us or to define whether we are a success or a failure. We cannot allow that to happen. We cannot give them more significance than they deserve. Now, many of you may not know what a Gordian knot is, but a Gordian knot is a knot that is so complex that it is almost impossible to unravel. It is like your well-fried Hokkien Mi, all tied around each other. And, you know, Alexander the Great was given a Gordian knot and asked to untie it to determine whether he will be successful or a failure. He infamously or famously just took out his sword and slashed the Gordian knot into half. So the only thing we are certain of is that uncertainty is a certainty. You can have at any point in time, whether you are young or middle-aged, dreams, hopes, passions, goals, plans for the future. But let us also factor in the fact, the only thing that we are 100% sure, that uncertainty is a certainty. Let us be flexible. Let us teach our young people to have that flexibility. Now, even with his dying breath, the Buddha reminded us of impermanence. You all who are students of the Dhamma will remember the last words of the Buddha. Vaya Dhamma Sankara Apamadena Sampadetta. All conditioned things. That means all things that come together because of conditions. They are impermanent. They will change. 
you cannot expect them to be stable or to be reliable. So all these things are ceaselessly changing. That's a reality, whether we like it or not. So let us live mindfully, heedfully, and adapt ourselves to this. Behold, this is my last advice to you. All component things are changeable. They are not lasting. Work hard to gain your own salvation. Do your best. It is in our hands to adapt. It is in our mind to be heedful, to be mindful, to see that whatever we do, our actions, that will create the immediate future, the middle time, the middle distant, and the long time, long distant future. They are all within what you actually work hard to do and not just sit back and dream. So the first noble truth of stress, of dissatisfaction, of association with the unpleasant, of dissociation with those that you love is a reality. Let us accept that this is a reality. We all work. We all start off really a maturish. We all start off not being very good at what we are doing. That's why we have to apprentice ourselves. That's why we have to learn. That's why we are interns. That's why you are house officers. That's why you are junior staff. There's a very steep learning curve. And during that steep learning curve, the reality is it is difficult. You will face disappointment. You might be reprimanded. All kinds of things will happen. So way even before we reach that stage, I think that we should be able to tell our young people that this is what's going to be happening to you. Learn to accept, learn to handle, learn to respond appropriately. All right? It is harder to move forward if you blame on yourself for everything or you blame others for everything or you live in denial. So the noble truth is reality. I see it all the time. So we must have right view, which is the very first part of the Eightfold Path. And our attitude is critical. Whenever we are facing disappointment or failure or success, we must have the right attitude, the Buddha taught us, irrespective of whether you're facing disappointment, failure, and I repeat, success. A slight change in our attitude can change the thing entirely. I'm having a bad day. Instead of looking at I, a big I, am having a bad day, a slight change in attitude. I'm having a learning and growth day. Now, very often people say, Hi, yo, my seniors, my supervisor, my management is so horrible. Every day, nag, 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 school, school, school. And this is a fundamental lesson I teach my medical students. How have you yourself been behaving towards them? Now, I find it very, very sad to say this. And again, this is reality. Our young people do not have very good manners nowadays. One of the fundamental things I teach my students at the first few classes that I meet them, believe it or not, brothers and sisters, is to say, to wish everyone good morning. Wish everyone you meet good morning. And I have great difficulty teaching them when you walk into the ward, the first place you walk past is the pantry where all the ward attendants are sitting, preparing food, doing this, cleaning that, the first thing you should do, walk into the pantry and say, Selamat pagi to all the attendants. And then as you walk to the nursing counter, wish all the nurses, sister, matron, whoever, good morning. And similarly to every doctor that you meet, whether you're senior or your peer, your life, I guarantee you, I tell them, will be infinitely better if you just have that small little change in attitude. 
Do not look at yourself as I am the great grand doctor. I can tell you the ward attendant is just as important, if not more important than they are. And I'm sure this applies to many, many other occupations as well. You know, Brother Bobby, I am not a very good meditator, but I am quite sure that I have acquired the art of invisibility. At the time when we were having face-to-face -face classes, in a little small room called a tutorial room, I can walk into that room, I can sit down and be completely invisible. So I tell myself, my meditation is so good that I have developed the ability to be invisible because my students are all happily looking down at their handphones and doing that. And until I shout, good afternoon, nobody even bothers to look up. So one of the great difficulties I have is simply teaching them, what do you do when you are in kindergarten and your teacher walks in? What have you been taught to do? And they say, well, we have been taught to say good morning or good afternoon. And I say that that is probably the most important lesson in life. So instead of blaming my senior, my management, my so many other people above me for being horrible, rude, no di diplomacy, nothing. I always tell them, look at yourself. Are you having the right attitude? And even if you are right, your management is horrible. Your superiors are terrible. I always tell them, do you realize it is very hard to scold somebody who is very polite and smiling? Do you realize that, I tell them? Okay, so I think that we must go back to very big, very basics. And one of the ways in dealing with disappointment, failure, so-called, or being scolded or criticized, is to look back at ourselves. Are we doing what we are taught in kindergarten? To be polite, to be diplomatic, to have respect for everyone as equals, whether it is the ama serving tea in a big corporation, to the janitor, to the CEO. And I think that if we have the attitude of looking at people with respect, it will bring us a long, long way. Now, can you tell the future, Brother Bobby? Uh, I can't. And so all our lives, people ask us, what do you hope to be in five years, 10 years, 15 years? Honestly, though, can we really answer that question? We have absolutely no idea what the world will be like in any given amount of time, even in five years, let alone 10, 15 years. So we must learn to have that ability to be flexible. Do not be what the Chinese say, say kang kang. Be flexible like water, flowing around rocks, adapting. Everything is impermanent. And if you know the Chinese word for dhamma, it is fa, and fa is a composite of two words. On one side, water, three dots, and the other side, to go out. Chu, chu chi, go out. Learn to be like water, flowing around all the obstacles in life, adapting in the best and most rational way. The first noble truth tells us, dukkha sacha, that is, a lot of disappointment. There is a lot of suffering in life. It's reality, no matter what your job is. But if you know Dhamma, you will be able to negotiate this like a good sailor around rocks. And of course, if you know how to cook, it's even better Then you can feed yourself well at the end of the day. And I want to tell the young people that I teach, it is perfectly okay not to reach your goal. And sometimes it's a blessing when you do not reach your goal. Honestly, sometimes it's a blessing. You may feel disappointed in the short term, but that too will pass when you see the reality of the situation and deal with it wisely. Now, in fact, in many, many aspects of our life, both good and bad, these things which we look at as good and bad actually may not be problematic. It is our attitude towards it, our thinking 
that creates the problem. You know, when we are young, as a young person, we look and we say, oh, my friend there, Papa, he's driving a big BMW. I also want a BMW. Now, as you grow older and you mature, you will realize actually it is just a means of transport. And you will not put as a marker of success whether you drive a big 7 Series or 5 Series car or you're driving a small little Alza. Success, when you realize it is not defined by that, there are far more parameters to which we can define success rather than the size of the vehicle in which we drive. But when we are younger, we tend not to think like that because we are still thinking very much along the lines of emotion, greeds, and wants. And if you define success as driving a BMW, then there will be no end to your pursuit. You will never ever be happy. Now, one of my medical students saw this slide and she was very happy. She wrote back to me that, yes, Prof, this is correct. Many of us had gone through life quite smoothly, for which we are very blessed. But also there are many of us who have gone through a lot of difficulties to be where we are. Sometimes we had met unpleasant people. Sometimes we had been scolded, humiliated, insulted, etc., etc. Now, I beg of all of you who had the great tragedy of going through all that, write it all down, but write it all down on a very important treasured paper called toilet paper, for which during this COVID-19 crisis, people fight tooth and nail to get an extra roll. But write it all down in your best pen and best handwriting onto the toilet paper. So-and-so made me angry. So-and-so scolded me, so-and-so insulted me, so-and-so barbecued me, etc. Write it all down, every one of them meticulously. And then after that, what do you do with toilet paper? You put it in the toilet and flush it away. And that is what we must do. Stop ruminating over the failure. Put that obsessive thinking to rest by journaling it and then flush it down the toilet. You can imagine if indeed someone had scolded you once 10 years ago and you're still ruminating over it in your mind every day, then that person is still scolding you. That unpleasantness festers. So write it all down and flush it down the toilet where it rightly goes. And nobody expected this to have completely changed our lives in the last one year. Brothers and sisters, it's already one year. One year I've been sitting on this chair, looking at this computer, teaching, doing what I need to do. No more outside, no more on the ground, but sitting, staring at a computer monitor. One year. Nobody expected this. People who had started businesses, so many of them in Johor Bahru had folded. Brand plans within our own very inner circle of friends, they have sisters who invested their life savings in businesses and just because of this, they lost huge amounts. So many shops, in a row of 10 shops, at least three to four now are closed. So what does this tell us is that the first noble truth that we are going to deal a lot with things that are beyond our control. We are going to look at impermanence. We are going to look at dukkha or stress. Now let us learn how to deal with it by a change in our mental attitude. So I've already mentioned this, that goals are conceptual targets. Do not think that you are a failure just because that goal is not being reached. Now, in contrast, some of my students come in with fantastic results. Out of a possible maximum of four, they come in at 3.94, 3.97, 3.9 something. Results which are so staggering that it frightens us. 
So they think that they are the best in the world. Some of them, in fact, did get that certificate which tells them that for HSC or whatever, they are the best in the world. So they come in with grand visions that I am the best in the world. Now, in Buddhism, we are taught that word I, that word ego, is going to give rise to a lot of pain. And as soon as you do the opposite, meaning you see yourself as a success, and that this success is going to continue, I think you are walking in very, very dire streets. Because one day, inevitably, you will meet disappointment, inverted commas, failure. And that success, which has primed you to think that you can do no wrong, has in fact done you a great disservice. I think we must all realize that I had accomplished this is actually a gross misnomer, misnomer. To have accomplished it, so many other people had contributed. Your parents, your teachers, your school, your tuition, etc., etc. It is not I have accomplished it. That which made you accomplish it is a group effort by many, many people. And these are temporary things. They are conditioned successes which can similarly change. So I like this Zen teaching. It's such a profound lesson. Having no destination, he says, I am never lost. It does not mean this man has no idea where he is going, but he is flexible enough to adapt all the time. His destination changes according to the circumstances. And hence, having no destination, I am never lost. I like this so much. Now, one of the fundamental teachings of the Buddha Dharma is cause and effect. Kappa Vipaka. What we do intentionally creates so-called karma. And it will have an effect, whether tomorrow, next week, next year, it will have an effect. So remember, if we had succeeded, there were many causes for that success. If we had failed, there were similarly many causes for that failure. So instead of just mourning and groaning that we had succeeded and celebrate or fail and go into depression, would it not be better if we address the cause of the failure? So if let's say it is a young house doctor that got scolded because he clucked very poorly and presented even worse during the what rounds, should he not reflect and say, how can I be better tomorrow? Rather than say, that idiot uh, of a specialist are terrible. Now, it is easier for us to do that because when we do that, it is not my fault. It is that terrible man. Now, most things are not either his fault or my fault. It is a combination of everybody's fault. Everybody probably has a hand in it. So what can I do? I can't change him, but I can change myself. seen as a failure. If it is similarly cause and conditions and effect, and many people will have contributed to it, I hope that we similarly realize that when we think we had succeeded or acquired a skill or a degree or have great confidence, that word I, that I put in inverted comma, can be very dangerous because you have again put yourself on a pedestal. The higher in which you have placed yourself, the greater the risk of falling. So thinking that I am great or superlative in any sense is ego. And that is not something the Buddha Dharma wants us to develop. 
the creation of this ego, which is actually an ever-changing reality. You listen to this talk, an hour later, you're actually a different person from what you were an hour before. So this I that you perceive as you yourself, this ego complex is actually ever-changing. And this is something in the Buddha Dharma that we learn and are talking about all the time and being tell, told to be mindful of and concerned about. Whenever you have the thought, I am great, I am right, only my way is correct, then you are in danger. For that is delusional and obviously coming with an inflated I. And even the structural context of the statement itself backs of conceit. Conceit, as those of you brothers and sisters in the Dhamma will know, is one of the factors which binds you to samsara, to dukkha. And conceit is one of the last factors which an, an enlightened being will eradicate before achieving awakening. Now, let's take a look at the English language. Let's reflect. Now, some years ago, I was giving a talk in another town and there was this venerable in the audience. He took a piece of paper and a pen. And as I shared, every time I used the word I, he make a mark on his paper. And at the end of the sharing, he called me aside and said, look at how many marks there are on this piece of paper. You had used I, I, I so many times in your sharing. Be careful for all the reasons that I have shared with us just now, that it may lead to an inflated ego bringing you dukkha. Notice in the English language, the word we, you, they, us, all are written in the lower case. But the word I, whether it is in the beginning, middle, or end of a sentence, is written in capital letters. That itself reflects this flaw. Now the realities of life is what the Buddha Dharma teaches us, not false hopes or patronizing us, but the realities versus the delusions that we prefer to believe. And it is because of this that the Buddha Dharma will not be a popular mass religion because the Buddha Dharma is a training of the mind on how we need to change our attitude and our behavior to have harmonious living. It is not a religion that dangles salvation on faith. It is against the grain of human greed. Everything that you learn in the Buddha Dharma goes against the very grain of greed. We are taught the very first perfection, generosity or dana. We are taught metta, unconditional love, karuna, compassion. So as you walk this path, it is the opposite of greed, the opposite that is to develop the, the personality or the characteristic of generosity of unconditional love. And this goes against the grain of human greed. And humans are selfish and self-centered. Again, the Dhamma trains us to be otherwise, not to be selfish, not to be self-centered. And in fact, as a general rule, if what you are doing is always based on what will I get out of it? What will I be as a result of this? Will I be richer, et cetera? It is a self-centered thing. And that is not what the Buddha Dharma teaches us to develop. It trains us to be the opposite, to be selfless and not to be self-centered. And human beings want a big permanent I. The Dhamma teaches us the delusion of any permanent or unchanging I. This cartoon, Peanuts, in this scenario here, illustrates the typical ego very well. When you get big, 
do you want to be somebody great? And Lucy replies, that's an insult. And the brother said, an insult? And Lucy replies, I feel that I'm great already. I think that many, many people, while we may laugh about this, actually within themselves will have this thought at various levels. And I think that one of the things I keep on nagging my students is greet everybody as an equal. You are not greater. You are not lesser. You are equal to everyone. Now, happy people focus on what they have. Unhappy people focus on what they want in the future that they think will make them happy. So irrespective of whether you had succeeded by whatever definition you defined it, or you had failed or got scolded, I think a very important life lesson we need to learn is not to take it personally. Not to take it personally. In many ways, the world exists and functions beyond our control. Failure does not define you. So do not obsess on it. Neither does success. As I said, both extremes are equally bad. Remember, if you fail an exam and have to repeat a year, or you fail in whatever job that you think you would have succeeded, it does not mean that you have failed. You have merely not done well in that career path. Imagine you force a fish to climb a tree. That fish will fail. Not because the fish is a failure, but simply because that fish does not have the innate ability to climb a tree, no matter what you do. So it does not define us. Lesson, very important for my students who are listening in, give yourself permission to fail. It is okay when you do not do well. It is okay. Ask yourself, why did I not do well? Yesterday, a student wrote to me, last year, I failed to get a high distinction. That's not a failure. For many people, getting a distinction is already a success beyond their wildest imagination. So by this person not getting a high distinction, it does not mean that she is a failure. Of course, we aim to get a high distinction. But not getting a high distinction does not make one a failure. So give yourself permission. It is okay. And I've got this beautiful certificate called Certificate of Failure, which I'm more than happy to share with anyone who thinks they need this reassurance. Lesson, do not take it personally. Be like Muslim cloth. You know, Muslim cloth is that fine white cloth with lots of holes. When the wind blows, it will go right through a Muslim cloth. So if you had actually done something wrong and someone is reprimanding you, let it go through you. Do not catch it and put it in your pocket, but let it flow past you. If you are not a perfect person because you had made errors, it does not mean that you are a bad person, for there are very few people who are perfect, okay? The late venerable taught, compare not with others. And if you can simply do that, you will rid yourself a lot of emotional stress, worries, and troubles. Do not regard yourself as bad or poor or inferior. We are all equal. Even the most terrible fish, I assure you, will swim better than any one of us if we are to compare it in the field of swimming. But if you want to make it climbing a tree, then of course the fish will fail. Now we are all human beings, not human going. So noble truth number one, there will always be frustration. There will always be stress because nothing will ever truly go the way you want it to be. Hence, 
within what we have, find happiness. You are a human being. In this moment, there is always something to be grateful for. In this moment, there is always something for us to be happy. In this moment, there is always something for us to be glad. And if my medical student tell me that I've got nothing, Dr. Wong, at this moment to be happy about, to be sad about, I say, who says not? Do you have a toothache right now? No, I don't have a toothache right now. Do you have migraine right now? No, I don't have migraine right now. I say, there you are. You've got two very big things to be happy right now. You just don't realize it. Remember, not getting what you want sometimes is a wonderful stroke of luck. Okay, because we do not know. Good, bad, who knows? One of the very profound lessons Ajahn Brahm teaches all the time. Good, bad, who knows? We do not know. Now, another important lesson is do not use a big goal somewhere and say that is success. Small steps. If I get scolded today because of some work that I did and I realized I was incompetent or not as good as the average, then try to improve. And if tomorrow I manage to improve, that is a success. Small steps in goal setting. Often we, news, we read in newspapers, child geniuses, people who can pass bachelor's, master's, PhD when they are teenagers, they become very sad when they are adults because they realize that when they become adults, the world is not as they imagined. And many of them were not fitting well. And some of them tragically even commit suicide. So for us, the vast majority of us celebrate every little success, every little step. So for me in medical education, I tell my students, if you get scolded today because you did not clap properly, did not present properly in your what rounds, ask yourself, where did I go wrong? And then after that, improve. If tomorrow you are like slightly better, well done, celebrate, have a big celebration. Goals must be realistic. So celebrate every little success, every little success. Every time you have managed to do something, throw a big party for yourself. Celebrate your strength. Now, please do not misunderstand that I see hopes and dreams as negative states. No, certainly I do not. I keep telling you they are skillful means. Hopes and dreams is certainly much better than doom and gloom. Our happiness, however, is always in the present moment. Live the present moment well and to the best of our ability, and our future will take care of itself. This is what we call right mindfulness. Even for someone who is dying, hope can give them strength. And that is why one of the important lessons I tell is do not destroy hope even in a terminally ill patient because hope is what gives us something to look forward to even if it is the next minute, the next second, or the next day. At first, there will be hope for cure. If indeed there is no cure, then we hope that at least whatever treatment will lead to prolongation of life. And if there is, rejoice. Now let us put it very honestly, Brother Bobby. Every one of us in this room listening in is dying. We are all dying. The only difference is you do not know when, when the person who is terminally ill knows roughly maybe two months, three months is being told. For the rest of us, we are also dying. We just do not know when. So, for the person who has been told that he has an illness, another hope, prolongation of life, because he may have things that he needs to do, people he needs to see, forgiveness that he needs to ask for or to offer. And finally, even at the very end, there is still hope for a peaceful, painless death. So 
Yes, of course, there is hope and we must not destroy it. We must let people know that all these are possible. They are small steps, but they are reasons to celebrate. Now, uh, even with the lesson of impermanence, anicca, which is such a big lesson in the Buddha Dharma, anicca is not negative. The fact that even our painful moments are impermanent gives us hope. The fact that even somebody who is not performing well because of impermanence, he too can improve. He too will be better. So good, bad, it too will pass. And students of the Buddha Dharma will know that the Buddha put this four categories of extremes, pleasure and pain, praise and blame, gain and loss, fame and disrepute. In our daily lives, in our work, in our career, in our studies, you are going to go through all this. And the Buddha said, a wise person, when he is having pleasure or praise or gain or fame, Yes, at this moment he's happy, but he should not be too attached to it because this is temporary. If you think this is your right, then you are going to be in trouble. And similarly, pain, blame, loss, disrepute, these two will affect all of us. But they are also temporary. Now, in Chinese culture, when we say, Somebody has developed his mind, trained his mind until the eight worldly winds do not disturb him. That means his mind is so well trained, so still, so calm, that neither pleasure nor pain, praise nor blame, gain nor loss, fame and disrepute can disturb his state of mind. Then we say, that this person is awakened or enlightened. And here I cannot resist telling you a little Zen story, a little Chan story, because it is related. Some of you may know of this Chinese gentleman called Su Tung Po. He was an official in the civil service, high and mighty at some times. And he was very interested in Chan. And he was having a friend, a Chan master called Venerable Fo Yin. And the two of them would often exchange views. So that was once Su Tung Po was meditating on one side of the West Lake in Hangzhou. He felt very calm, profound meditation. And when he came out of it, he thought he was awakened. So he asked for a pen, paper, and he wrote a beautiful scroll which says, Ba Fong Cui Putong, which means the eight winds do not disturb me. As I mentioned, that is a statement which literally tells someone who understands that I have awakened. So he rolled a scroll up gave it to his attendant and told the attendant, roll across the West Lake to the other side, go up that pagoda and give it to Venerable Fo Yin and he will understand. So the poor man rolled across Sai Wu, West Lake, and gave the scroll to Venerable Fo Yin. He opened the scroll, he looked at it, he took his pen and he wrote back two words. And then he put down his pen folded back the scroll, gave it to the attendant and told the attendant, please bring this back to Su Tung Po. Poor attendant rolled back across, those days no internet, rolled across the Sai Wu, gave the scroll to Su Tung Po. Su Tung Po was expecting profound praises from Venerable Fo Yin of his achievement. Instead, when he unfolded the scroll, he saw the two words, and he was so furious, he demanded that the boy row him across the lake so that he can confront Venerable Fo Yin. So when he was brought back, 
he saw venerable for him and he told venerable for him how can you be such a rude person on that beautiful scroll which tells you pa fong choi putong you defame me you destroy that scroll by writing those two words on the scroll and venerable for him calmly turned around and looked at sutung po and said you wrote pa fong choi putong the eight winds do not disturb you neither pleasure nor pain praise nor blame gain and loss fame and disrepute will disturb you all i wrote is two words fang pi for those not chinese educated fat then he said you said that eight winds also cannot blow you just my little fang pi has blown you across saibu up this hill to see me so it's a very nice chan lesson if you get the story sudung po thought he was awakened he was not a slight blame or disrepute or so called loss to his ego the whole structure came tumbling down so what we are trained to handle as we study the buddha dharma is to realize that when you are successful when you have pleasure pain uh, pleasure praise gain and flame look at it enjoy the moment but do not be attached and similarly when you have pain or blame and loss and disrepute remember don't take it personally it's impermanent it too will pass you can be better so what are your hopes and dreams for the future you want to be filthy rich well there's nothing wrong with righteous wealth if you earn that wealth without breaking the five precepts without harming the environment but if it is a single minded pursuit of wealth that is founded on greed then it is going to be bundled with much stress and pain but what if your hopes and dream is to help people to be relieved from pain and suffering no please don't let go of that this is what we call right intentions or right thoughts notice you can have hopes dreams and desires without it arising from greed or craving when someone corrects you and you feel humiliated and insulted that is because you got a huge ego if you are a good student and when someone corrects you you realize that that person is trying to help you to be better in which case you will in fact say thank you so there is a clear distinction between tanha craving for something that arises from greed and chanda which is a noble or a wholesome aspiration this is one of my favorite photos this i took when i visited a small little town in belgium called louven it's a very historical town small town about an hour away from brussels which you can take the train to reach and in there is a very famous university the university of louven this is the main library of the university of louven now belgium has a long tragic history the university of louven is a grand old university this library was destroyed during the first world war down to the ground the academics the students the people they raise money they rebuilt it in the classical architecture and they fill it back with the millions of volumes of books and it became a great university in the second world war it was again flattened to the ground for twice this beautiful library building was destroyed after the war again they went through the painful process rebuilt the building in the classical style and fill it up with books again so while this building that we see this is the grand staircase which leads from the ground floor library to the upper floor libraries you see it's very very classical it is actually a very new building it is barely less than half a century old which by brush belgium standards is new but what 
I loved as I explored this library. Is at the turning of the grand staircase is a Buddha image, which they place there for people to pay respect. It shows you whether you're on the ground floor or as you go to the upper floor, in the pursuit of knowledge, there is this great Eastern sage who taught not a religion, but taught knowledge, wisdom to help us lead harmonious lives. So you can summarize the whole of the Dhamma training as the transformation of tanha, our selfish greed, our big ego into chanda, our wholesome aspirations. So these are different mental states. Dhamma chanda, kusala chanda are wholesome states for developing that which is good and harmonious. In short, we just call it chanda. Tanha is directed towards sensual gratification. If I get praised, wow, I feel so shocked. If I'm told I'm very good, wow, I feel so shocked. If I'm scolded, it's an affront to my ego. I am a four distinction, 3.97 CPGA scholar. How can this stupid professor scold me? Well, if you have that sort of attitude, you're going to suffer for the rest of your life. Because if you have the insight that this is for your betterment, then your entire attitude towards it is different. Chanda is directed towards benefit, not just to outside, but also to yourself. Nobody told you to treat yourself any less well than your neighbor or your friend. But it is based not on greed, not on selfishness, but on generosity, selflessness, and harmonious living for all. So the Buddha's teachings showed us the way to harmony and happiness. And the Dhamma is our GPS. Whenever you reach a junction and you're not sure, the GPS tells you, turn right. So similarly, the Buddha Dharma is our GPS. It teaches us to lessen greed, anger, ignorance, cultivate loving kindness, compassion, generosity, etc. So if you ask me what's my lineage, well, I'll tell you my lineage is Hahayana because every step should be making me my peers, my family, my friends, my students, my Kayana meters more happy. Ehi pasiko means to come and experience yourself. Apply what is taught in the Dhamma and see whether this change in attitude actually helps you to overcome your problems, disappointment, failure, pain, dukkha, whether it actually makes you a happier person with harmonious living. The Buddha Dharma is about making us being civil, cordial, wish each other good morning, show each other respect. Isn't that what we do every time we enter a temple, a center? We wish every brother, sister, we say in Anjali position, Namo Buddhaya, we pay respect to the Buddha image, we pay respect to the venerables. Now that lesson should not stop the instant you walk out of the center that lesson should transmit to our everyday lives. You don't have to bow down to everyone formally, but at the very wish, at the very least, wish each other good morning, thank you, goodbye. It is basically mannerism, changing us from a self-centric person into a selfless individual. So Dharma family, friends, students, this, it is in our hands, in many ways, within our ability to create the causes and the conditions. Of course, many things like COVID-19 is beyond us, but we can do what we can within our ability. Now, Eckhart Tolle is one of the modern meditation masters. He teaches rational, not emotional responses. And he says, whatever your situation, accept it fully. If you don't like something, then take action to change it or leave the situation or surrender and accept it. 
anything else, blaming yourself, knocking your own head, is madness. Now, these are very important traffic lights. When we are upset, when we are scolded by someone, or when we think we fail, or on the opposite, when you think you have succeeded and you are celebrating, the five fundamental precepts are our traffic lights. It ensures that we do not do something wrong, whether because we are frustrated or depressed or we are celebrating a success. The five fundamental training rules, the Panchasila, are all secular human precepts, secular human principles. Abstain from killing, stealing, sexual misconduct, telling lies or taking intoxicant, alcohol or drugs would serve us very well, whether we are in depression and disappointment or in success. I think this is one of the most important lessons the Buddha Dharma had given us to handle failure or success. Everyone wants happiness. Nowadays, when I meet my ex-students, I no longer ask them whether they have passed their post-grad exam, their MRCP, their FRCS, or whether they are senior registrar or consultants. Instead, I just ask them, are you happy? If they are happy, everything else is secondary. Of course, my final dream and the dream I hope everyone of us here have is to have no further wishes, no further dreams. We live content with what we have, doing our best to improve our society and those within our circle of influence. So again, I say be like water. Remember the Chinese word for Dhamma Fa. Be like water. You can be very flexible. You can make the obstacles less distressing by going around them in the path of least resistance. So again, I come back to this Peanuts cartoon strip. Okay. Again, here Charlie Brown is seeing this little girl who is very wise. And she said, there's a real lesson to be learned from seeing Snoopy's house, the dog's house burned down. Adversity builds character. Without adversity, a person could never mature and face up to all of the things in life. Charlie Brown in all innocence asks, what things? And she replies, more adversity. And basically, this is what life is about. This is life. So let's live mindfully every day, doing our best today, for it will take care of tomorrow. And many a times, just putting one foot in front of the other, that's progress. And that's okay. Finally, learn to laugh at ourselves. People are not laughing at us. We can join them and laugh at ourselves together with them. George Burns, who lived to almost 100, was a great comedian. And he said, first you forget names, then you forget faces. Next, you forget to pull your zipper up. And finally, you forget to pull it down. Instead of seeing this as defeat, he see it as something in which everybody can laugh. At. Brothers and sisters in the Dhamma, my students, everyone here listening in, I wish to say a very big thank you to all of you, to the IT team who has been working hard this last half year, to all the moderators, I want to say thank you to all of you all for allowing this Dhamma sharing to continue every Friday. Thank you. Over to you, Brother Bobby. Thank you, Dr. Punya, for the very informative, very practical, highly applicable talks uh, tonight. There are seven questions at the moment. Let me read out the questions for Dr. Wong. First question from Colway Kate from Putra Heights. What if it's a failure to do something right? What if we have done something wrong, something harmful? What if we have hurt someone? 
the advice to write it down on toilet paper and flush it away is that really appropriate some people are very good at not caring about their wrongdoing they hurt people when they then they just forget about it that's not what we want to become yeah i think this is very clear brother when ken the person who is doing this obviously has very little insight i mean when you have done something wrong as i said many a times in this sharing a very important question is to ask ourselves what is it that i have done wrong and to work on correcting it remember i use the example of my own students who are working and then at bed side or what rounds they get scolded and many of them will just say stupid senior stupid registrar stupid consultant but i would say no look at yourself what have you done that led to that situation maybe it is seriously something that can be improved on and then if you look at that it that way can i correct myself can i be better tomorrow now if you can correct yourself and be better tomorrow you can help break this vicious cycle but a lot of people have these ruminating thoughts they do not forgive themselves partly because our children are very very privileged i have always said do you realize that our children are even more privileged than the bodhisattva you think that his father shielded him from pain we are shielding our children even more so because of that some of our children and young people take so called disappointment very very badly and it keeps ruminating in their mind that oh yo i've been scolded i'm a failure i'm a failure so yes please make sure you correct yourself brother when can i'm not asking you to just sit there and cry you know at, but at the same time you have to move on and to move on means we have to let go of things that had happened that had created a state of unhappiness because in ruminating over it ceaselessly you are merely going to call, create even more unhappiness a more negative mental state all right Bobby, your voice is off. Okay, thank you, Dr. Wong. Question from KCBA, Duka Kos. Brother Wong, we normally learn from mistakes in life, then earn a stable living for our family and ourselves. What is the best age for us to really put our time seriously in practicing to realize the Dhamma? Ah, I wish I started when I was a child. because i think that the best age is now now no matter how old you are as i've shared with you all many a times before my late mother was a very strong buddhist but she was a very devotional buddhist chanting every day offering every day to eat so we offer again you know a very devotional type of practice nothing wrong with that that's the beginning but unfortunately did not proceed and so when i was a young child i saw it as very ritualistic you know when you are a teenager you rebel against everything so mother say put three just things say why three just things you know that that sort of attitude mother say bow three times say, why bow three times you know that that sort of thing why all of us go through that phase i wish i had started earlier okay but i think that the best time is now no matter what age you are children of course for heaven's sake don't go and teach them but teach us some upada <coughs> that way will definitely make them run away and instead teach them what the buddha teach us to teach remember the first lay person that came into contact with the buddha is yasa what did the buddha teach yasa he didn't start by saying for noble truth eight four power you know he didn't he, yasa would probably run away had he done that instead what the buddha taught yasa and this is clearly documented in the vinaya is he taught yasa about dana sila what is the rewards when you do good things well when you do good things ta 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 happens 
what are the consequences when you abstain from doing bad things, when you abstain and ta ta ta. So very, very, I would even say non-religious concepts, just purely secular human values. And only when Yasser's mind was ready, he taught Yasser about the Four Noble Truths, the Eightfold Path. That, you can see, is what we today call a graduated training. So, yeah, I think that we all should be seriously learning this, but appropriate to our understanding and mental maturity. I keep telling Sister Suk Ching, if you're going to go around telling the children everything, do not, do not, do not, they are going to do the opposite. Because in many ways, I'm still a child. So when people go around telling me, do not, do not, do not, then you're likely going to do it. So instead, I always tell Sister Suk Ting, if possible, tell the children the positive aspects. Be very generous. Be very kind, etc. Rather than do not, do not, do not. Ajahn Brahm used to tell us, if your spouse is not a Buddhist and you want your spouse to learn the Dhamma, put a book in the hall of the Buddha Dhamma, for example, the late Chief Venerable's What Buddhist Believe, and then you tell your spouse, you are not allowed to read this book, huh? Don't open this book, ah? And Ajahn Brahm say, guarantee she will read the book. So this is what I mean. We have to be able to tune it to the age of which the person is. And of course, for us now, in the sunset years of our life, let us work even doubly hard, for we honestly do not know how much time we have. Okay? Thank you, Brother Bobby. Thank you, Dr. Wong. Another question from Wei Kian. Many people are indeed self-centered. Think about many young and old people today pursuing career success, material wealth, social status and popularity until they neglect the Dhamma. It isn't easy for them to appreciate the beauty and value of Dhamma. How might we reach out to those who are self-centered? How might we show them the value of Dhamma? Okay, Brother Ken again. You know, Brother Ken, I agree with you entirely. Many people, if not most people, are self-centered. You remember that famous saying by Cao Cao, Yang Pat Wai Gei Ting Ji Dei Ni. That means if you don't bother about your own personal success, even the heavens will destroy you. Well, that was during the warring states in China, the, the, the Sun Kuo period. So it is true, many people, young and old, are self-centered, especially if you come in a society which is very materialistic, very, very materialistic. And without naming names, even our own country over the last two, three decades have moved very much in that direction of materialism. Everybody wants to be super rich tomorrow, huh? not even one month later, uh, tomorrow wants to be super rich. And they sacrifice much values. So that is true. But that is not a new problem. Remember, Brother Khan, when the Buddha was enlightened, why was he reluctant initially to share the Dhamma? Because when he looked, he saw that this is a generation that is very, very much interested in sensual gratification. And the Dhamma goes against the grain of sensual gratification. And then it is only when, according to the Vinaya, when he had this great Deva Brahma, not even Deva, Brahma is a different class, who told him, there are some with little dust in their eyes. I hope, Brother Ken, you realize what is meant when he said there are some with little dust in their eyes. There are 376 people listening right now. There are 376 people with little dust in their eye who prefer to tune in tonight and listen to an old man talk rather than watch something interesting on Netflix for sensual gratification. So yes, we have to accept that. That is human beings 2,600 years ago and now. So it is true that it is not easy for them to appreciate 
the beauty and the value of the Dhamma. How might we reach out to them? Certainly not by words. You can go around telling till you turn blue. The Four Noble Truth, the Eightfold Path, you will only turn people away. Because, ah, uh, yeah, this brother, we can every day suffering, 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 dukkha, dukkha, dukkha. Who wants to listen to you? No, they won't. They're not interested. Your message of doom will be rejected. What I would suggest that if indeed you are to be in any measure of success, successful, is to live our life with so much metta, karuna, so much dana and unselfishness that people look at you and say, hey, Brother Bobby uh, is very unique. You know? He's actually very different. He's a very selfless person. And you see, uh, you scold him, uh, he doesn't get angry. Uh, you know? He's so calm. He's so still. He has got sama samadhi, right? Stillness. Why? Why is he so still? How come he doesn't get angry when I say prudential insurance, useless one? Uh, how come he doesn't get upset? He doesn't start stamping around? Well, then people are interested. So this is what we learn, that while you may dress for your religion, talk about your religion, eat for your religion, do all kinds of things, preaching for your religion, very few people live the lives that are taught by their teachers. What we should do for any measure of success as Dhamma Dutta workers or influencers, a new word I learned in the last few months, is to be able to live your life such that people say, that is a good man. I don't care what his religion or belief is, but I can see that he is a good man. And in our work, this is where it is the most useful way of doing it. So whatever you are doing in your work, if you are, have shown that you are a selfless teacher or a selfless insurance man or a selfless car salesman, and that you honestly is a good, decent human being, interested only in helping and not ripping off somebody, people are not stupid. They can see the genuineness in your actions. And I think that that way of showing metta, dana, karuna, is a far better way of sharing than you talking. Metta, karuna, dana, they are all words. Huh? Please remember, they are not nouns. All right. Thank you, Brother Bobby. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Wong. That was your answer given was exactly what Acham Brahmali shared with us on uh, how, how they, he, they, he gets uh, those Norwegians to, to be curious about the change that he has become and they, they are interested in learning about the Dhamma. And our four questions from Brother Wei Li. Is there a relationship between attitude and right view when facing disappointment and challenges in life? Yeah, short answer is of course yes, because right view gives you the correct perspective of looking at life. And basically for us, you do not have to go into the great details of right views, talking about devas, etc., etc. But basically a very fundamental, solid understanding that right view includes first cause and effect. Whatever you do will have an action. Whatever you don't do also will have consequences. So whatever you do, good or bad, will have consequences. Now, short-term future, medium-term future, long-term future. So that changes our attitude. We are mindful of what we are doing. Secondly, the right view on the realities of life, that life basically has three universal characteristics. Anicca, impermanence. Things are going to change because they are conditioned. So they are not going to be stable. They're going to be constantly changing. COVID-19, for example. Second, dukkha. Because it changes, it gives rise to unreliability. This unreliability gives us a lot of disappointment. And third, not self or non-self, anatta. There is no solid thing. It doesn't exist independently. They are all interconnected. So this will affect that. Now, if you can understand this tree, not at the linguistic level, but with actual insight, then you will adjust your life accordingly. All right, that means when something happens, you know. 
Well, it is impermanent. What do you expect? And I've often shared, people come to see me complaining, oh, my children, oh, my daughter, oh, my daughter-in-law, why are they not behaving this way? And I will tell them very frankly, they are not behaving the way that you would have behaved because they are raised in a different environment. They had a different education. They are in a different culture. So if your son has been sent to UK boarding school when he is 15 years old, how do you expect in all honesty that he will behave like you who studied in Sekolah Menengah Jenis Kebangsaan in Kuala Lumpur? Obviously, that mental conditioning is going to be different. So if you can accept that, then you can work your way around it like water around rocks for the harmonious living of everybody. All right. Thank you, Brother Bobby. Thank you, Dr. Wong. Question from Hans Box. Theravada meditation practice and Mahayana practice like chanting and making vows to go to Pure Land, are they the same and able to attain Nibbana and free from samsara? Ah, ah, ah. I've been asked this Pure Land question not just once but a few times and I've always given the same answer and this answer is taken from the platform Sutra of Hui Neng, Liu Chu Hui Neng Chan Jing. Okay, you can get a book free on the internet. In this platform sutra of Venerable Hu Hui Neng was a sixth Chan patriot. He was asked by a person about the Pure Land. And he said, the Pure Land is supposed to be Si Wan Pa Qian Li away to the west. One zero eight zero. Uh, one Si Wan Pa Qian Li, one zero eight thousand. One, one zero eight thousand. Si Wan Pa Qian Li away. He said that's to the simple mind of the simplistic person who thinks of it as a physical place. He said this is a very simplistic thing. And he just gave an example. If you live in, if you live in the West, then the West is some more West. And you live in that West, then the West is some more West. So how can there be a physical place called the Western Pure Land? So that's one, he said. So he said it's not a physical place, but it is a place in your mind. And he said, if you close your eyes now, he told this man who questioned him, I can show you the pure land immediately. And the man was stunned. Ah, how can? He said, yeah, close your eyes, I can show you. And he said, close your eyes and ask yourself, have you practiced the 10 wholesome deeds? Si wan, 10, one, zero, eight. Have you practiced the 10 wholesome deeds? Have you kept the eightfold path? If you had practiced the 10 wholesome deeds and kept the eightfold path, the pure land is not si wan pa chen li away, but immediately in your mind. If you had been doing the opposite, that means the 10 unwholesome deeds of body, speech, and mind, and the eight wrong, not eightfold noble path, huh, but the eight wrong path, huh, that means wrong view, wrong intention, etc. Then the pure land is truly that far away from you. So that is the standard answer which I've given all these years whenever I have been asked. Meditation does not bring you to Nibbana. Meditation is a means of training you so that you will attain the nine and the tenth factor of the path. And I've also shared this many times. What we are taught and what we do is the eightfold path. But it does not end at the eightfold path. The eightfold path has the last two, Samasati and Samasamadhi. But it doesn't end there because with the eight factors of the path being cultivated with right views, right intentions going on to right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness and right stillness, when this is properly practice, it will bring you to Samayana, right insight. And Samayana will give you Samavimuti, right liberation. So these are means to an end. So whether you're talking about meditation or you're talking about the Mahayana chanting or Theravada chanting or Mahayana meditation, they are all basically the means for you to reach this end. And people quarrel over the finger pointing at the moon, which I think is very silly. The finger pointing at the moon is not the moon. The moon is Samayana and Samavimuti. We are quarreling over the finger, you know, 
whether my meditation method is better than your meditation method, whether my chanting is better than your chanting, which is very silly. Okay, I hope you'll get that. All right, thank you, Brother Bobby. Thank you, Dr. Wong. That's the last question for tonight. So, uh, join us next Friday for the 20th Breaking Myth talk on uh, No Time to Meditate.